In this film, we will concentrate on what happens below the surface when coarse fishing for roach, bream, tench and carp. We've placed underwater cameras in many of our fishing spots, and that's the reason why we can present you with a unique insight into the world that lies below the water surface when coarse fishing. We zoom in on the fishing and present all the good tips. We go for exciting sight fishing after carp with take apart rods with great coarse fishermen who give you all their best advice. Before each fishing situation, we'll show you a detailed drawing of the rig that's used. Here, it's float fishing after carp. Pre-bait and bait mixtures are described in detail, and in many instances we'll see the pre-bait out on the fishing spot and how the fish react. Here, it's coarse fishing for bream in moving water. And while filming tench, we managed to get unique underwater footage of them roaming the pre-baited fishing spot. We will see examples of many different types of fishing under different conditions. And in this way, we will get a deeper understanding of coarse fishing, both above and below the surface. Here, Lars will chum a spot and fish with a float. It could, for instance, be a spot where he would fish for carp or tench or big roach. All coarse fishermen know that there are many small roach when fishing for bigger fish. It can be an irritating factor and it can be difficult to assess the movements of the float. We'll place a camera on the bottom of the fishing spot to follow the reactions of both the roach and the float while fishing. First, Lars will chum the fishing spot with small pellets that usually attract the bigger fish. Underwater, we see how the pre-bait lands right before the camera, and it's astonishing how fast the smaller fish flood in from all sides. For now, they're just curious. Now we chum with a ground bait mixture that will attract both larger and smaller fish. The smaller fish create activity on the pre-baited spot and this attracts the bigger fish too. Corn is a good all-round bait that a lot of fish species like. Here we'll be using corn as a hook bait so therefore it makes sense to chum with a few handfuls of corn so that the fish can get used to them. We're not here to fish for small roach. That's why our rig is constructed for bigger fish. The float is a waggler type and it will carry three AAA split shots. All of the weight is placed directly below the float. Two small BB shots are mounted as anchor weight and the hook will sit on the bottom. The rigs can also be seen on our homepage, wideopen.dk. Out on the pre-baited fishing spot, the roach swim nosily about. They're still a bit cautious and careful, but are slowly beginning to eat the ground bait and the loose corn. If we'd been aiming specifically at catching as many roach as possible, we would have used a smaller hook size, 10, 12 or 14, and we would have used maggots as a hook bait but this is a typical fishing situation where you're fishing for bigger fish. So therefore, we'll bait the hook with three pieces of corn. A lot of roach have now congregated out on the pre-baited spot and have started feeding on the bait more systematically. We're now going to see different examples of how the roach react to our hook bait and how the float reacts when the roach bite. Their first interest is awakened when the hook bait falls through the water but as it sinks to the bottom, it's not as interesting. 
There is one roach, however, that moves after the bait, takes it in its mouth, but then spits it out immediately. In general, the roach are still very suspicious of our hook bait. There are exceptions, however. There are lots of loose pieces of corn lying about, but apparently this roach is very interested in the three pieces of corn on the hook. As it drags the bait away, the float is pulled under. A quick pause ensues, and then comes the strike. The timing was perfect. Here we see a roach hastily go for the bait as soon as it lands, but the strike is set in too quickly. The roach hasn't swallowed the hook yet. Even though it looks that way on the float, it's quickly pulled under because the roach moves the bait to the side. There are lots of scent traces in the pre-bait that's cast out and it's slowly starting to work. Both roach and rud are attracted to the chumming area and the perch have moved in because of all the commotion. Under normal circumstances, a pre-baiting will start to work optimally within a half hour to an hour, and subsequently you'll chum with one or two bait balls and a couple of handfuls of particles approximately every half an hour. Now something happens in the chumming area. The fish are spooked and swim to all sides. A pike has entered the area. It's been lured in by all the activity in the chumming area. It's astonishing just how fast the roach return. They're attentive at all times and keep a bit of distance to the pike. They're very well aware that they're way faster than the pike should it decide to attack. The pike is scared off by the splashing of the bait bowl. Our hook baits are on the bottom and the roach are completely indifferent until one roach suddenly moves towards the bait with great determination. It quickly swims away with its prey and the float is suddenly pulled down and then moves to the side. Even though the strike isn't set in immediately, the fish isn't hooked. In this instance, it has to do with the fact that the fish wasn't very big and the hook wasn't even in its mouth. In contrast, the fish is hooked really quickly here. It takes the bait while it's sinking and last strikes immediately as he sees the float react. At other times, the float behaves in a manner so that you're full of doubt. Here, the roach takes the bait in one big mouthful and is already hooked. The lead is on the bottom while it chews on the hook and bait. There are very few reactions in the float, and obviously there's doubt whether a strike should be set in. But the fish has been hooked all along. And here we see it lifting the lead. The float stands up, and here comes the strike. We now have an idea about how the roach react to our hook bait and how the float behaves. The trick is to strike at just the right time, depending on whether you think it's a big fish or a smaller fish that's taken the bait. This, however, isn't always easy. We're going bream fishing on a lake. We're here with Peter, who will be fishing with a pole rod, and Tony, who will be fishing with a bottom rig and his quiver rod. The water in the lake is too murky for us to have our underwater camera out. 
The pre-bait has been mixed specifically for this fishing session. And in the bonus material for this DVD, Tony shows exactly how the pre-bait is mixed. Peter wants to fish close to the shore, and he'll be fishing with an 8-meter pole rod. The rig consists of one of his homemade floats, which carries up to 6 grams. Two float stops are mounted, one on each side of the float. Approximately 40 centimeters above the hook, some lead is mounted. Almost all of the weight is placed here. Three to four split shots have been used to fine-tune the float, and this weight is mounted just above the thin 15 centimeter long leader. The hook is a size 8 or 10. I can see it out of many rødskaller. I hope I can come again down to the little smaller fish. So I'm nice with to come a little mice in front and then so cast us and then see if I can at a certain point come forbi rødskallerne there. And the front of it blew clamped so forholdsvis over the same day. Det er på grund af alle, alle småfiskene ude i overfladen. Vi kan se det ude af skallerne, de springer rundt, bare der kommer fod ud. Og så gælder det samme at få noget foder samlet på et område, og få fiskene samlet, samlet et sted. På grund af alle de små skaller derude, så vil jeg fiske med nogle ret store orme i dag. Men som vi kan se på fløjet ud, så er det svært at komme til bunden, for det ligger og sejler rundt det meste af tiden, uden at, uden at stille sig rigtigt op. Det vil sige, at bly, det når aldrig at komme, at komme ned. Skallerne, hvad, der er skaller i overfladen hele tiden, den når tager, tager ormen lige de første 20 cm i, i det øverste vandlag. Fisker med forholdsvis store fløj på over, over 6 gram, som normalt er, er rigeligt til at, at, at komme ned igennem vandet. Vi kan se ude, ude på vandoverfladen af rødskallerne, de allerede har taget arven, når de slæber os med, med fløjet op i overfladen. Prøv med lidt. en endnu større arven med tre kasters ved siden af. Prøv at samle helt blyt i en stor klump, 20 cm fra, fra krogen. Tony's rig for feeder fishing is made like a loop rig. In the loop, the feeder glides freely on the line, which in turn runs through a swivel, and the fish can take the bait without feeling any resistance. The big advantage with the loop rig is that you very seldom experience line tangles. The loop is mounted approximately 50 centimeters above the leader, which has a diameter of 16 millimeters. The hook is a size 10. I have tilsat some of the casters, so it's just casters, an angle, angle mager to feeder foot here. So I. Når jeg skal fylde feederen, så tager jeg bare propper den ned i foderen, og så kører jeg lige med tomtotten. Og så får jeg pakket feederen med foderen. Så fordi der er så mange skaller her, og vi sådan set er ude efter at fange nogle gode barsen, så sætter jeg en ordentlig regnorm på. Jeg kunne også vælge at tilsætte nogle regnorm i feederen her, men det venter jeg lige lidt med indtil fiskene de har indfundet sig. Så. Så. så har jeg sådan, når jeg fisker med feeder, så har jeg line, kører med lineklips, det vil sige, at jeg har fundet den afstand, jeg vil fiske på. Så klipper jeg linen op i linenklipsen, og det betyder, at når jeg så kaster efter et bestemt punkt over på den anden bred, jeg har valgt den sådan lille kløft i træerne derovre, der kaster efter hver gang, så vil det være nøjagtigt den samme afstand, at feederen den rammer på hver gang. Og hvis jeg så er i stand til at kaste nogenlunde lige, så vil jeg også kunne ramme på, den samme, på det samme punkt derude næsten hver gang. Så det er formålet med det. Og så 
og kaster med fire, så foregår det i sådan et forholdsvis blødt kast, ikke alt for hårdt. Og så kan du se, så er linen sad i lineklipsen der, jamen så stopper den derude. Så forholdsvis hurtigt tager jeg lige to omgange på hjul, sænker stangspidsen, sådan så jeg kan få sunket linen, så jeg har linen under vand. Så lægger jeg den så sådan, så den kun lige spidsen ude på feederen der, den røde spids derude, den, så den kun lige bøjer svagt. For lige at få noget fod ud på pladsen, så tager jeg lige feederen og fodet op derude en 3-4 gange. To begin with, they both catch roach, but gradually they start catching small-sized bream too. Now, the bigger bream have arrived. So the bass and after we have camped with a little bit small fish in the start, come up there, a good tongue fish. Oh, that's flat. I can only lie against up in there. Oh, I'm just lying to fat there, so I don't get knocked. Stangskaftet. Ja, så gav det på det. En rigtig god stor brasen her. En rigtig flot. En rigtig kraftig bygget brasen. Den har taget en stor rum, kan vi se. Den er nok omkring de 3 kilo. Peter has managed to lure the big bream in on his fishing spot too. Endelig er kommet til bunden, hvor der går nogle ordentlige basser. Det er en brasen på omkring 2,5 kilo. Der var en rigtig god stor fisk her.
we're now going fishing with take apart rods. And once again, we'll be fishing with Peter and Tony. The rig for this type of fishing is very different from what we've seen earlier on. The float is a pole float with a carrying capacity of less than one gram, so it's a very sensitive float. The line is 16 mm nylon and three number four split shots have been mounted 40 centimeters above the hook. A single number four shot is mounted above the tippet, which is made out of 14 mm nylon. The hook is a size 10 or 12. This means we'll be catching big and strong fish using very light, thin leaders. It's a hot day and the carp are active. They're cruising on the top water here in the shallow part of the lake. Peter's fishing with a single piece of corn on the hook. Right along the bank, we see a carp on the surface. With the long take-apart rod, the bait can be placed with great precision in front of the fish, and the extremely thin leader and the small hook ensure that the fish won't get suspicious of the hook bait. Peter sees a carp and he can now place the bait right in front of it. The line is mounted in an elastic band that can stretch up to five meters. Without this elastic band, the line would immediately snap. Go <laughs> Det var en rigtig dejlig fest. Ja, det var god. We're going float fishing with Nikolai for smaller carp. 
The rig isn't so different from what we saw Lars using at the start of the movie. The float is a waggler type float and it carries two and a half AAA split shots. The float is fixated with a single AAA split shot and two float stops. An AAA and a BB split shot are mounted relatively close to the hook. The float depth has been measured with such precision that the hook bait is right on the bottom. The split shot closest to the hook doesn't touch the bottom, only the hook bait is on the bottom. The hook is a size 6 and Nikolai fishes with three pieces of corn. Nikolai's pre-baited a spot six to seven meters out and we've placed a camera close to this spot and can see that the chumming has already attracted a lot of small roach. The sound alone of the bait balls being thrown into the water lures the roach into this end of the lake. In no time at all, an incredible amount of roach have entered the chumming area. Nikolai has been particle pre-baiting with both pellets and corn. Even the small roach attempt eating the hard pellets, and they're a tad too big for them. That's how it should be. After all, they're supposed to be there when the carp arrive. After half an hour or so, the carp have already entered the chumming area. Small roach are constantly playing with the bait. In our underwater footage, we can see that the carp are becoming more active. They've started to show a bit of interest in the corn and pellets that are floating about on the bottom, but they haven't started eating them yet. A carp almost vacuums the bottom in front of the camera. The carp's activity on the bottom is revealed by small bubbles on the surface. The carp now returns and finishes the job. There are more carp in the area looking about for the particle baits. Now, after approximately one hour, the carp are really active.
On this beautiful spring day, we'll be fishing for bream in the river. Once again, we're with Nikolai, and to start out with, he'll be fishing bream with bottom rigs and afterwards with floats. Nikolai's mixing a badge of pre-bait which primarily consists of a ground bait made for fishing in moving waters. Usually this type of bait will be relatively heavy. He also adds some rather coarse particles and breadcrumbs. The pre-bait has to be moistened so that you can make a big heavy ball that doesn't dissolve in the very instant it hits the water surface. There are a lot of good food particles in the pre-bait for instance, small pellets, coconut, and hemp seeds. For bottom fishing, Nikolai uses a special rod with a very sensitive rod tip, a so-called quiver rod. This is a so-called Peter Noster rig. In order to attach the line end to the lead, a water knot may be used. The line length is 25 centimeters. The lead weighs 18 grams. The line length to the hook is 50 centimeters and a size 10 hook is used. The hook bait will lie on the bottom. As a hook bait, a combination of corn and earthworms is used. Below the surface, the pre-bait has started to attract some bream. Nikolai chums with one or two bait balls every half an hour or so. Some of the bait balls aren't squeezed as hard as the others, so they're quickly dissolved and emit lots of alluring scents. Bottom fishing is a lot like float fishing. You have to be attentive at all times and the strike should be set in at just the right time.
It's a nice bream that weighs well above three kilos. Now, around midday, the fishing has stagnated a bit. The underwater camera reveals why. A pike has been attracted by all the activity in the chumming area, but as we have seen before, the roach are practically unaffected. They just keep a bit of distance to the pike. The bream, however, don't seem to move in as long as the pike is there. The pike is gone and now the bream re-enter the chumming area. Nikolai now changes to a float rig. He uses a relatively large float with great carrying capacity. The float is fixated at the top and bottom. Right below the float, an SSG split shot is mounted. Approximately 30 centimeters above the hook, a BB split shot is mounted. And 15 centimeters above the hook, a little number one split shot. The hook is a size 10. The line length is a bit longer than the depth that Nikolai fishes in. This means that the bait will be dragged over the bottom. As a bait, Nikolai uses a cocktail of earthworms and maggots. When the float drags the bait across the bottom, a big downstream line bend is created that must be corrected continually so that you have contact with the float.
We're now going tench fishing with Morton, but first we're going to see the pre-baits, hook baits and rigs he'll be using. As particle bait, he uses both big and small pellets. Pellets are fish food used in fish farms, fish ponds and aquariums. Hemp seeds are really good for chumming. First, they have to be put in water for 24 hours and then boiled until they open up and the sprouts emerge. There are many different kinds of bait that can be effective for tench fishing and corn is one of the best hook baits for tench. Another hook bait that can be really good is maggots. Ordinary earthworms, or these tiger worms, are excellent for tench fishing too. A cocktail of worms and maggots, or corn and maggots, quite often is a really good choice. Pellets are also good to fish with, but since they're extremely hard, they can be difficult to mount on the hook. Here's an imitation of a pellet. It's a soft dough that can be put directly on the hook or mounted on a hair, for instance with a piece of corn. Boilies can be an advantage, especially in waters that receive a lot of fishing pressure. And the fact that you avoid catching too many small fish when using boilies is also a great advantage. Banana flavour has been added to this boilie and it's made as a pop-up boilie which means that it floats. You can fish several hours with boilies without ever having to think about changing hook bait. This is Morton's favourite rig for this particular water. A special lead, which is called a method feeder, and a short leader. He uses a pop-up boilie which will stand up from the bottom. When the tench sucks the boilie into its mouth and stretches the leader, the weight and resistance from the feeder will guarantee that it's hooked. Method feeders come in different sizes, but usually ones that weigh around 20 to 30 grams are used. As a leader, a special thin and strong leader material made of several strands is used. The distance between the feeder and the hook shouldn't be more than 10 to 15 centimeters. For tench fishing, Morton uses a basic and very common ground bait mixture, where the main ingredient is breadcrumbs. In addition, he uses hemp seeds, small pellets and biscuit flour. Furthermore, corn flour has been added as well as potato flour. The ground bait is squeezed around the method feeder. The method feeder is a simple piece of lead with wings that can carry a load of bait. All you have to do is squeeze the bait around the feeder. It's recommended to moisten the bait a bit more than usual. Now the lead has been camouflaged and the bait functions as an added casting weight, something you have to be aware of when casting. The most important thing about this rig is that the bait ball is right there beside the hook bait. The bait ball will slowly dissolve and leave a scent trace that will attract the tench. We begin fishing in the evening and once we've chosen a spot for chumming, we'll place the camera. It covers a considerable part of the chumming spot. We chum with corn and with some extra ground bait. One of the rods, the one with bait and a method feeder, is cast out right in front of the camera. A mere 20 minutes after we've cast out, the first tench enters the chumming area. In fact, it's already eating some of the pre-bait, but only for a short while. Then it disappears. The sun is setting and a big school of perch swims by the chumming area. A small pike swims by with great determination. It looks as though it hasn't had dinner yet. Usually, tench are very active at night and we do see some tench entering the chumming area in the last light of day, but we cannot film at night.
in the first light of day we see a pike again. Actually, on this particular location, we only see the pike in the first and last light of day. In the middle of the day, we don't see them in the chumming area. The same holds true for the perch, but this isn't very typical, it just happens to be the case on this particular lake. Morton fishes quite close to the shore, because the tench in this lake swim along the edges. The chumming is working. Soon, the tench enter the area. They eat from the pre-bait, but then something typical happens. They eat temporarily, and then they disappear. This is a process that we see time and again. The tench goes for the bait on the method feeder and not the hook bait. The scenario repeats itself ten minutes later when another tench swims by. From this camera angle, we only see one of the hook baits. The two others are further out and out of sight. Morton places the tench on a mat so that its protective layer of slime isn't damaged. Oh. It's a beautiful tench that weighs 3.2 kilos. It's very typical to catch tench in the first hours of the day. The catch has disturbed the chumming area, but the tench will return soon enough.
The sun shines sharply on the chumming area, but the tench are there. They just stay a bit in the background, close to the two other hook baits. Another nice tench, weighing 2.8 kilos. Tench have now returned to the spot in front of the camera. And they eat from both the ground bait and the particle bait. But even though there are many active tench, doesn't mean that they just go directly for the hook bait. Here, something interesting happens. The tench looks at the feeder with suspicion. It uses its pectoral fin to inspect it, and suddenly it clearly realizes that something is wrong. It almost flees. It hits the bottom with its flank to warn the others, and they too swim away. Let's have another look. The sun now hits the chumming area very directly and Morton can actually see the fish. Det ser god ud, de to, der står dernede nu. Uha, uha. Uh. 
Uh -huh. Der er nogle store fisk ude på min, på min højre takkel. Ja. Ej! Ej, den var god den fest, der er mand. Dammit! Ej, den var god. But the fish returned to the chumming area very quickly and they're quite active now. However, they clearly avoid the hook baits. Here we'll see how a line bite looks from the perspective of the underwater camera. A good deal of line bites can be avoided by using back leads, a lead that fixates the line on the bottom. There's still much activity in the chumming area, but the tench still enter in small schools, eat for short periods and pull out again. This tench, for instance, is very determined. It enters the chumming area. Eats and then swims away. The tench almost takes the hook bait. Here we see it again. Thank you.